Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to um, uh, Inclusively. Uh, we have a, a special meeting today uh, to talk about AI and ML. And uh, uh, our guest uh, is uh, Greg Mayo, Chief Architect at NetScout. And uh, obviously, I will be here with Chris Lewis, my, my partner in crime here, who is the founding director at Lewis Insight. Uh, before we get started, uh, a couple of notes. Um, we uh, th This meeting is uh, uh, open in the sense that you can uh, uh, interact, you can say, send your questions, your comments, you can talk to each other, you can talk to us, uh, uh, all of that, everything is public. So whatever you say, your name is going to appear on it, and uh, everybody else, uh, everybody else in the audience uh, and us will be able to see it. So uh, please be, be mindful of that, uh, uh, be polite and respectful, uh, but at the same time, feel free to share your thoughts. Uh, we really look forward and uh, you are an important part of our conversation. Uh, and um, uh, after the, the meeting is being recorded and it will be available offline uh, uh, for you to watch it again if you want to. Um, said that, uh, let's get uh, to it. Uh, well, first of all, uh, inclusively, we do uh, many events like this and uh, uh, also live events. And uh, uh, I would like to so thank our partners, uh, which are shown here, um, uh, the Mobile Ecosystem Forum, UK10, TIP, and uh, Telecom TV. Um, and so said that, let me get off this so you can see us better. Um, so today we're gonna to talk about uh, uh, AI and ML. This is something that Chris and I and our previous guests talked a lot about uh, tangentially. So every time we get and talk about it. So this time we're gonna to get to the bottom of it and see what is that AI and ML can do in, in terms of inclusivity. Uh, it's a big topic. But uh, Greg is the perfect person to address it and to go in with all of that. Um, uh, just a quick disclaimer uh, at the beginning, we're going to be talking about disability, mental and physical disability. Uh, we are not physicians or doctors, uh, so we are not making any judgment on who is, who isn't, uh, what is impairment. And, you know, we just talk about how technology can help in it. So uh, take it as it is. Um, with that said, uh, maybe uh, we will start first with Chris giving us an update on uh, uh, Inclusively, and then uh, Greg can tell us all about himself. How about that? Thank you, Monica. And as ever, lovely to have everyone with us. Thanks, Greg, for joining us. The the, the Inclusively initiative that, that Monica and I kicked off uh, is, is, as it suggests, is, is attempting to bring together and raise awareness around the telecom industry but more broadly than that i think we'll find from the from the following discussion and certainly what we've had so far from the the cto at telus from the head of C chief digital officer at bt from people at vodafone people at lots of lots of different organizations we've seen many many elements of where it's talked about the diversity of employment within organizations we're trying to move the discussion to be about actually raising the, the use of inclusively to look at all of the customers and customer interaction. And, and as Monica said, during many of those interactions that we've already had, both the ones we've been able to talk openly about and the private ones we've been having with organizations, because not everyone's comfortable talking about it uh, in public yet, but we're trying to encourage them. But when, whenever we get into these discussions, I think two really important things come out. One is that it, it isn't just black and white in terms of, who's in who's excluded who's included or is it just about vision impairment about hearing or, or today we're going to talk mainly about cognitive issues the degrees of impairment across all categories are just there are so many of them the thousands and thousands of gradation gradations that we can think about so in in trying to raise awareness we are opening up an enormous range of of topics and potential misunderstandings from, from people because people tend to have a very um, very set idea about you know what what being what being blind is what being hearing impaired is what being cognitively disabled is uh, and I think what we 
what, what I hope was going to come out in the next session is is looking at one particular part of this uh, through through Greg uh, to get his view both on AI but also on the on, on this cognitive and uh, that, that side of things and there is no answer to the problem there, there is only raising awareness and gradually building awareness into everybody whatever whatever your role is within your organization or or, or or you reaching out into the the broader ecosystem or indeed society that everybody can help do this so this is a call to arms for everybody able to help the understanding of the moving parts of course is critical the understanding of the technology is critical the understanding of the people is critical now and of course the understanding of the business case is critical so but there are many there are many steps in in this discussion we're not claiming uh, for a second to to be dealing with them all what we are doing is we work our way around our in, around the industry because of our contacts uh, with, with, within telecom especially but i'd say it's actually broadening out from telecom to to many of the the other areas so uh, everyone's welcome as monica said please do pop your questions in there uh, for those not familiar uh, I, I'm blind, so I won't be reading the questions. Monica will be handling questions and feeding them to Greg, and then we'll we'll all comment as we go through. But you're here really to to listen to Greg, and I think Greg, would you like to introduce yourself and perhaps give, even give a bit of background as to as to how you ended up on on, on inclusively with us? Because uh, I think it's it's worth telling that story, and then you can get on and, and give us your perspective on AI and ML. That would be great. Uh, thanks so much, Chris and Monica, you know, for having me today. Um, I went to uh, school in the 80s, um, went to college for uh, computer science, and that's kind of where I started studying artificial intelligence and really had a um, liking for cognitive science and those things. Um, and then in my career, I over the last 30 or so years, my, my focus has been on large uh, networking, whether it's telecommunication networks, financial networks, anything where networking is involved. And in that realm, networking is very much like a human body. It's a complex system with different components that are distributed. There's KPIs you have to understand. And so I used my AI ML background in that area to do, you know, analysis, pattern matching and things and apply it to, is the network healthy? Is it not? Is it safe? Is it not? Um, and that's where I've been, um, you know, learning the algorithms and applying them over the years. Certainly as now um, where I've reached and, you know, my kids are older, um, I was able to take care of my mom in the final years and she had, you know, some different disabilities. And now and I'm at a point where I'm doing more volunteering and at a point where also I can use my background in, you know, the technology space to interact with folks like yourselves. Um, I happen to meet um, Monica at an event that we throw for our, our, our users. And um, she was the head of a panel where they get up and, you know, answer various questions on the panel. And um, afterwards, I was able to talk to her. And then, um, you know, we had a lot of simpatico around this topic area. And so, um, and that's how I kind of arrived here. So I, I'm very passionate towards the technology. There's obviously a lot of uh, mystification about it, um, certainly both even within the technology sector and certainly the farther away you get, the more mystified it is to folks that don't necessarily understand some of the, you know, finer details of it. Um, and so I think trying to um, raise awareness on this um, and especially um, starting to really put it to use, right? And that's one of the things that I've seen is going, you know, from the 80s and even in the 80s, AI and ML had been around, right? So the, the people don't realize the technology has been around for such a long time. It's just you know, some of it's more as law, right? The computing now is so fast and distributed that we can start to attain speeds that we need to to run, you know, 7 billion parameters inside of a chat GPT cloud. And, and that with better designs and algorithms have now got us to the point where the stuff we thought of it, you know, people have thought of this stuff for decades. It was just more, wasn't applied. And then certainly even in the space of, um, you know, disabilities, you have um, my wife worked with uh, Ray Kurzweil a uh, great, um, you know, um, technology founder in the space of AI who quickly went towards how can he apply it towards optical character recognition. He worked with CB Wonder on how to like make it to where you can interact with the keyboard better. So, um, you know, this space has been around for a while. It's just now the AI umbrella is becoming much more aware and, you know, it becomes much more of a topic for, for, for this kind of setting. 
So thank you for I, having yeah. me. Glad to be here. Well, th thanks for being here because, you know, as Chris said, we often have trouble finding people that are willing to really talk about all those topics. But before we get into the disability, can you tell us, you know, what is that we should expect? Because there is oftentimes a lot of misinformation out there. You know, as you said, AI has been around forever, but people are just paying attention in our industry now or in the last couple of years. Um, and sometimes there is a lot of hype. You think that, you know, either AI is going to solve all our problems or it's going to take us to self-destruction mm -hmm. uh, or that AI is chat GPT. So, and none of that is true. So <laughs> can you give us a little bit about what, sure, what, what sure. should, how should we think about it? That's a great, it's a great uh, question. So to your point, you know, people often think of it as just a single thing, right? And for the masses, it tends to be what we see either in movies or you know, TV and papers and, you know, whatever streaming podcasts. And it can be sensationalized with, you know, the Terminator scenarios where it takes over, you know, whatnot. And, and it also can be, um, you know, brought into, you know, more practical realms. And, you know, what I like to look at is that, you know, the purpose of AI and ML is to automate stuff for us, right? You know, is to help so that we don't have to do some of the things, and especially if we can't do some of the things, right? So that in the land of, of disabilities, you know, automating, mechanizing something that can aid us has always been there. And, and you know, point solutions within AI has been around, again, optical character recognition and what's in AI and ML are lots of different kinds of tools in the tool bag, if you will. Um, and there's, there's machine learning. People hear ML, that literally is machine learning. And it's just algorithms that are learning. And those algorithms can learn by watching stuff over long periods of time. And after just seeing it over and over again, it's like, yes, this is different. Or it can just take an algorithm and say, I'm going to throw a 10,000 things against the wall. And I'm going to tell you these things are different from these things. And these are like, and those are like, those are just algorithms that can then be tuned into now taking and understanding, okay, I can calculate what's into that picture, what's on the wall. And so the AI ML collective is lots of different things that then people now, what's sensationalized it is the chat GPT. And it's not coming from the movie sector. It's coming from the reality that that platform of deep learning that we saw kind of IBM kind of was that first one to really hit it where it, it won, it beat Kasparov in chess, right? That was a big AI moment, right? In fact, you, you know, you, you um, back in the day, it was always like, yeah, AI is going to really do well when it can, when it can beat the chess master. It, it did, right? And then, you know, okay, now we have ChatGPT that passes the, you know, the MCATs or the LSATs. Now the awareness and the now, but then people associate AI ML with just large language AI generative models. And you can get lost in all of the hype about it. What matters for what we're talking about is what can you do with it to help humanity? And it's not the big chat GPT things. It's the, this huge tool bag, use the little things, you know, these algorithms can help here. These algorithms can help here. And not every algorithm has to be a chat GPT, you know, hosted 7 billion parameter model. And people get, you know, kind of attracted to the light of that. And in my business, even, you know, I have to use different techniques to understand the network, you know, human body. And I don't try to use chat GPT type out large language models for everything. So I think if we can start, you know, getting to where people are focusing on delivering and solutions with now that tool bag is so accessible where a couple of smart teenagers can literally build an app that is AI infused, if you will, towards a targeted, you know, solution, whether it be, you know, something for inclusivity or for whatever. And so it puts the hands of the power into everybody because the tools are so accessible, chat BT being one of them, but it's, you know, the big, you know, automated hammer to sometimes just knock in a little, no. Greg, 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 you mentioned that the, one of the words you just used there, which I'd like to pick up on, you said AI infused. <laughs> and no, and, and it's, it's important because uh, you're quite right. I, I, I go back to AI back 40 years ago, pre-Kurtz file and with the expert systems around computational linguistics. 
and we always said then you had to pre-edit or post-edit whatever you put in. So do you are you are you implying by saying AI infused that AI it's not controlling everything that there has to be either a pre-element or a post-element the human element can can you touch upon how you see the human element I I guess in the oh. network you're aiming for you know as little human intervention as possible but I'm just curious as to as to your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, I, there's a whole aspect about um, learning models for AI and and how to train them in that aspect. And then there's the aspect, again, of um, um, how to apply that into human learning. Um, you know, and, and, and in training, you know, again, everything isn't a large language model. Large language models are great at basically sifting through tons of documents and pictures and basically predicting anything that could be asked of it about that, including the LSATs, the MCATs, any test, anything. Now, that doesn't mean it, you know, can help somebody, you know, physically see something. Now, somebody can take an AI algorithm, apply it to a smart app on a phone that takes a picture, puts it in your ear and tells you what's there. That is AI infused. You don't need ChatGPT for all that. You need small tidbits of AI. So I guess where I talk about AI infused, it's like, again, AI is a collective of lots of different algorithms from, from visual yeah. algorithms, from large pattern algorithms, deep neural network algorithms, supervised, unsupervised. And sometimes the little ones can be used, put together and boom, you got a nice app. And in the end, to me, what matters is the app. Who cares what were you like? Do you care what was used if the app is, is helping you to see something? You don't right. care if it uses ChatGPT or if, whether it uses a for, a for loop, right? <laughs> well, in fact, I think I mentioned to you, I use an application called Be My Eyes, E Y E S, which has now brought out a Be My Eye AI version. And I'm trying to find out from the guy that's produced it how, how he does it, what it's based upon. He won't tell me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the, the mystery, and you're quite right, I love the fact that it, it describes a picture to me as a blind person of people around me and or, or surrounding around me. It's phenomenally useful. But I, you know, I want to, because I'm an analyst, I want to understand the nuts and bolts of how it works. But, but do, do, in terms of that distinction between machine learning and, and AI, is there, is there a barrier or is this a gray area? How do you distinguish between the two? Well, so machine learning generally uses algorithms to, you feed data into the algorithms, right? And unsupervised is very good for time series stuff. Like take a signal and feed it in. And when that signal goes like this, it can tell you, it doesn't have to know anything, it learns, right? And you can take that and feed in five signals and learns when they all change together. It knows nothing other than it learns over time. Is it different using mathematical algorithms? Now, if I've got a kid and you want to teach a kid to do something, that's not generally how it works. Let's say you want to teach a kid to fish. You don't just go to the side of the bank, put down the fishing pole and walk away. Or actually it's worse, put down the reel, put a can of worms and put the fishing pole and say, you know what? You should be able to figure this out. You basically show them a few times, yeah. like, hey, here's how you do it. You know what? If you do it like this, you get a hook in your eye. So you don't do that. And you teach them. So then you get into teaching, not through like uh, more algorithmic models, but literally through associative learning. And that's where some of the expert system technology of old kind of get thought of as kind of old, but you still have to have the notion of inferencing and knowledge bases because yeah. you, you the knowledge base is what says, oh, there's a worm. The worm goes on the hook. The hook does not get in my eye. You know, that stuff you can teach way faster than trying to use a huge thing. You just tell the people, don't, you know, put the hook here. So where I get back to that again is, is people in our industry even get hung up on the fanciness of the tool and forget about what are we really trying to do? Let's just build a small app. Why aren't we building an app to help somebody hear this, help somebody see this? And, and even in my, my competitors will start marketing how good their stuff is doing using something, but it's like, but what is it doing? All I care about, and it goes back to somewhat of like the Turing, the Turing test kind of no, um, approach, which is like, you know, if I'm giving you a result and you don't know how it was done, but it gives you what you want, who cares what is behind the curtain? If it's assuming costs, you know, social responsibility, all that good stuff. 
do you care if it was an AI chatbot or if it was just a person, a monkey? <laughs> if it, right, if it ticks socially all the right stuff. But people get focused on, no, I want to use ChatGPT to that, but you don't. The monkey's going to get it right half the time. I don't need ChatGPT. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, hold on. Uh, we have a question about control of regulations on AI. Uh, uh, we'll get to that later. But uh, Greg, what could you tell us a little bit about, you know, um, the, the the sort of mental issues? How can they be addressed potentially by uh, AI or ML? I mean, I, I uh, heard a lot about people talking about how you can have like therapy. So, so you know, it's like a just that you know Eliza at the beginning which was like kind of a joke but kind of like pushing it forward to something where it can be useful and uh, I guess that the question I mean the debate there is that yeah you can get something like chat GPTs, GPTs to do it um, but it clearly it's not going to be as good as a human doing therapy however it might still be better and cheaper as nothing at all and so is it useful or is it not? Or how should we think about it? And or are there other ways that, you know, you have AI can help people with uh, mental and cognitive disabilities? Oh, so that's a great, uh, that's a great question. And um, I have the benefit that my daughter is a, a licensed independent <laughs> social worker. Um, so she does a lot of <laughs> social therapy, um, certainly with um, young children. And, you know, and, and trying to and look at you, uh, your question, Right. Certainly a chat GPT can sit there and go, well, tell me about your mother and how was your day? And it can do pretty much the standard, you know, kind of question and answer stuff that you would expect, you know, some standard one on one to go through. Is that going to be beneficial to somebody? Maybe. I don't think so. You know, that's not what my daughter would tell me would be beneficial. Um, but, you know, perhaps and chat GPT can do that today. Right. You can get on. I'm sure you can find an easy you know, therapy app for that. What I see, I think, is back to where, how can we use the different tools to actually impact? And like one of the things my daughter does is lots of different techniques in her therapy. So sometimes it's art technique, sometimes it's sound, sometimes it's visual, sometimes it's different stuff. And I think that there's a, a field where AI can be used to accelerate how to get information into the person the way they consume it faster, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, and so there's not a lot of research in that area, you know, obviously, um, you know, and, and certainly generally, right, you talk about, you know, the area of cognitive, certainly the areas of the mechanical aspects of the body are the quicker ones we can attack with, you know, we can build things we can, that can help right away. With the mental aspects, it's not as obvious as like, well, what can we build with AI? Like, you know, I can't build just a quick app that takes, you know, that can take a picture and do something. What is it you're really trying to help within this aspects? Is it just a chatbot therapy person so that, you know, Greg Mayo can go get his therapy on Thursdays? Or is it, can we use the techniques to maybe, you know, I would say crowdsource. I say crowdsource because I see today's youth building content delivery different than the elders of the older businesses and can we get apps content right i don't care if it's an app it's now it's anything it's a phone whatever can content get delivered to people that impact in that area it's i think you know again it's um i haven't seen a lot of, of you know out there uh, i'm sure it's well i guess i guess part of that is about the medical practitioners you know and and getting getting into their heads and, the, and getting into their training. You know, one of the things that we've noticed in, in some of the early inclusivity work is that, you know, yes, we can, we can re-educate people of, dare I say, our age, you know, but, but actually the people coming through, to your point about the developer community, actually getting into universities and schools and, and making people aware that, that these requirements exist. And if I, obviously I follow now a lot, of, a lot of sort of inclusive design people on various social media, and I saw something the other day, which I I'd never would never have occurred to me until I started looking at this, which is that you can animate your signature on email. You can do all sorts of fancy things with it, but actually that is incredibly distracting to people with certain cognitive conditions. So one of the one of the this this comes back to the question I think of identity, and if you if you identify as having a certain issue, then does the system respond to you by blocking out 
a lot of light or by rendering it to your point about which ch communication channel gets used Mm -hmm. You know, there, there has to. This touches upon so many elements, from, and and I think we saw some of the announcements this week from people like Qualcomm about putting more of this processing power down into the device. You know, I I guess we we're the assumption we're working with is that it will all be done in the cloud. I think as you as you just said, but actually this gets distributed throughout the whole of the ecosystem, all the way out to the individual, because it's got to be it's got to be there to help every, everybody every point. And and I think you're right that, that we we need that crowdsource developer community to to be to be delivering this this sort of this sort of stuff. The big guys will will deal with it. So I'm, I I should hold my hands up and say people like Microsoft do an enormous amount of work around accessibility and inclusion. So do Google, um, Facebook, perhaps to a lesser extent, but I don't really get exposed to that. But I think we've got to be, also be very aware that. At, Every touch point that we the individuals have with with the systems of the future, with the whatever we want to call it, you know, we've got to be aware that we'll need to render things differently and perhaps screen things out, perhaps give a, a simpler interface. You know, we've we spent the last 10, 20 years basically cluttering up our screens, haven't we, with with more and more icons and more and more fancy, yeah. fancy, uh, fancy stuff. And actually that perhaps that's not the answer. Perhaps we will finally go back towards rendering it in a way that that suits monica or suits me or suits greg or suits your daughter when she's working in, in therapy and so on so it's a big question I don't, I don't underestimate the 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 severity of the question i mean certainly you know i mean i i love watching sci-fi movies and you know i like to look at them and go yeah that's probably gonna happen not gonna happen mm, already happened you know and you know the notion of a <laughs> of a device like from Star Trek that can translate, that can um, in real time basically connect you to anything by, you know, I mean, that's practically there today, right? You know, essentially, you know, I can almost have my phone do translation, take a picture it you know, in real time, access virtually anything I ask via ChatGPT, it, that's close, it's getting there. Now, how much does that help us? Sure. I mean, day to day life. Right. I mean, um, you know, I think when we talk about inclusivity, I also look at not just, you know, abilities is even like gender. Like, you know, my parents, you know, as you know, before they died, the <coughs> technologies were just not as, um, you know, my father was very much in computing in the old days, but now the newer stuff where um, they weren't just using it as much. Right. Even cell phones were, were hard to use. And so that means that they're being blocked out from using a technology. So certainly I would think AI by breaking barriers should also help the age gap for folks that technology is very difficult to access, right? That's why they're still just getting the simple things that can press a button, right? To send a distress signal and whatnot. Um, so it's, I think helping that, you know, helping the elderly benefit from AI is also a whole other area. I, and, and I think that's one of the things that we have touched upon in the other in, inclusively discussions is that, of course, we, we we focus down in my case on the vision impairment community, uh, on what your daughter's doing on the on the cognitive issues. But actually, with the elderly population, you know, a lot of people tongue in cheek say to me, it's the disabled and the not yet disabled, <laughs> you know, because a big proportion of that elderly population will begin to lose their hearing, will begin to lose their sight. And we know the, the degrees of uh, cognitive issues and, and dementia and so on. So it is about making sure that we, we use this technology properly to keep them as included as possible for as long as possible. And so it's almost flipping it on its head, isn't it? From where, I where people- I'm even thinking a little bit bigger, which is not so much the like loss of cognition as there's a generation and even it's not necessarily age-based throughout the planet that doesn't know how to use technology, even though it's simple for me and you are just like, what do you mean? Yeah. Just, just press here. And they're like, well, I, I don't, I don't even know what you mean. Like yeah. that may sound simple to us, but I'm sure, you know, a lot of people in countries don't just have access and we forget some of the simple things. Certainly elderly is the first and it's not necessarily their cognitive thing. It's just, they were born pre-internet, you know, even, I'm 56, but I mean, I'm, I work in technology. I have friends who aren't that tech savvy, <laughs> and it's a barrier for them. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And they don't have any normal disabilities. They're just not. 
people. Monica, have we got? Did I hear a question yeah. come in? Yeah, we have, we have more questions. Actually, there is uh, somebody talking about uh, uh, AI um, for um, how can AI help elderly for may help uh, for uh, loss of hearing, uh, loss of vision. And I guess that you know this is something that we've been going through all the time. You know, you just. Uh, uh, sooner or later, we're all going to be disabled, or, or we have been disabled in the past uh, for some time. So it, disability is it, it, not something that is just a few people out there. It's not a minority. It's most of us at some point, which is not to, it's not like a sort of an appropriation kind of thing, but it's like the fact that at some point we all need something and we need to be able to access it. But let me ask sort of a devil's advocate question here from the other end. It's also true that uh, disabled people might be also more, be more vulnerable. So when you have AI that is able to kind of guess and do kind of be more intrusive, um, it, it, could it be also a situation where uh, disabled people, especially mentally and cognitive disabled people, can be more uh, exposed to vulnerability scams and things like that? For sure. I mean, um, I would say that, you know, this technology brings the capabilities for a lot more of that. Um, you know, and Again, I think, you know, and one of the questions even asked about, you know, regulations and things like that. Um, I think we have to look at it in terms of, you know, the broader scope, right? We could talk about probably session after session after session, right? And, you know, the governments are coming out even with, with their statements. And I guess I'm, I like to focus, you know, as a realist in my job about what little things can be done to prevent either misinformation or prevent you know, the malicious aspects of it or whatnot. And, um, and I think that, um, um, is what I was going to say. It is, but, well, perhaps the other, the other element, that, and it goes back to your, your fishing example, <laughs> uh, which, I, which, you know, and it's that thing about the, if we, if we, if we build around our, non, our understanding of the way things work, but we don't allow for people who have an impairment. So stu perhaps a stupid example, but can somebody with no arms go fishing? You know, is it because we have to we have to make sure we don't build in the bias that exists in, let's say, society today into the machine learning and into the uh, into the algorithms. So I guess part of the question is how do we avoid falling into the trap of just automating? I think what you, you said was, was the goal of, of automating the status quo because we know that many people are excluded for all sorts of reasons. You, you mentioned that having the, the skills to be able to do it, the thought process, the adaptation to do it. You know, so does that, do, do you think that, I don't know how that, because there is a danger there, isn't there? Not only about the malicious side of it, but about the, that we build a system without, and, and we're talking about inclusively, about building in inclusion from scratch, that we make sure we cover all possibilities, all the edge, all the peripheral cases, when we're designing all systems, which is a massive, it's a tall order, right? But but if we don't do it, then this is where it's different in 2023 than it was even five six years ago. Is that to deliver a a mass you know scale change to the planet for an area like this required big governments, huge businesses, massive things like that? Because because we would need to have huge discussions on this with the tool set that's available for any person that knows Python or any simple language to build fairly complex integrated AI systems is super easy, which means that there's a new avenue to get things to people that aren't gonna go through the traditional ways of how do we make sure all the big businesses do it right by everybody. It's going to be, I think you're going to find it's going to be more of the organic solutions popping up, solving real problems, and those are going to stick because we don't, it's almost like, again, like the record industry, right? I'm a musician and it's like, you don't have to wait for the record producer to be like, yeah, I like that music. You, boom, it's out there, right? Somebody comes up with a good idea for solving a, a disability problem or anything. It's immediate now. So that's it's unfettered and it's not regulated and this and that, and that's another discussion, but it's a different world of 
worrying about is the AI collective going to handle all these corner cases? It doesn't matter because the collective now is everybody that can write an AI program. Do you know what's Go on, Monica. Go on. Can, can, we, can we go back then, uh, since you mentioned regulation, go back to, to the question and talk about it. So we've seen there is a, a lot of uh, efforts from the government sides, I mean, worldwide. So different governments coming together, trying to get make sure that AI is sort of well behaved. Clearly, that's a big concern, as, as you pointed out. On the other hand, the kind of genie is out of the box here. It's kind of like open source. It, it's like uh, everybody has access to it. And clearly that includes risk, but it's also a huge opportunity because at the beginning you said, you know, it's going to be just a couple of teenagers that might be able to develop an app. So it seems like we're past the point where regulation can stop anything. Uh, and maybe that's a good thing in the sense that that's going to encourage the ecosystem, encourage you know, whatever. Uh, we have to be aware of the risks, but also we don't we wouldn't want to have any eyes that is so tightly regulated that those couple of teenagers can do anything. No, I mean, and that's a great point, right? I mean, it it's past the point where you can stop AI from being applied to something because now it's out there, you can write the algorithms. But sure, you can you can build a gun, but you still have to stop the person, right? I mean, so it's AI is not is what's going to destroy us it would be ourselves right so it's it the regulation has to come on the use of it not can you know we're going to stop development of large language models like it's not large language models that are the problem <laughs> did greg you know that what, what you just when you just talked there and you monica made me think is that traditionally the the development of let's say assistive technology or or assistance human assistance was always done within each let's say disability group or even with the even within each subgroup of each disability the the danger that actually i think this falls into is that if we develop or if your two teenage people greg develop a solution for you know somebody with alzheimer's you know is it can we can we then easily plug that together with dealing with someone who's losing who's losing their sight at the same time or the hearing's going because my experience certainly to date is that this has really been done in isolation within each within each group but i think and that that what obviously worries me that we're not going to have a, a coherent set of building blocks that we can bring together to address you know multiple situations but but I, actually the excitement that it creates where the, the third sector you know the charity charity sector or the like the us the national foundation for the blind or the rnib over here you know they would have developed things in the past actually the expense was too great what 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 the whole compute environment does because we've got the compute power, the storage, the cloud, the devices, actually the possibilities of developing things by the people who understand the different, you know, impairments and disabilities, I think is enormous. I, I, that's, Absolutely. Yeah, I like Absolutely. that. I think that's a very, very good point. Thank you. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, again, I'll say one more time, we, we don't have to wait for the Microsoft or Google no. to come out with it. Literally, we can go program it. It's, you know, so easy to program AI systems now. Well, that's all. It's almost, I think, the phrase democratizing AI popped into my head while you were talking, you know, yeah. so it's like saying people, anyone can do it as long as the power of the big guys doesn't block it. And I, I, I don't really have a view on that. I, I think it's too early to have a view on that at the moment. Well, they can't because it's been released. Llama model it's open source. Yeah, to the open world. Source. It's a, and yeah. it's, a, you can argue, okay, Llama is not as good as Bard or is not as good as open AI. So it's slightly not as good. It's, Plenty good enough to write very good AI models and train them. But um, I have to say here that it's very easy to say bad things about the big guys. But in this particular case, they, it's not like they are stopping. They're not trying to prevent. Oh. So uh, I guess the question is that we need to make sure we deal with bias in the right way. But bias can be introduced by anybody, <laughs> big and small, good and bad. Um, because well, a lot of times bias is introduced without intention and intentionally. So, so there is a lot that is, so actually, I think that there is a situation here where everybody's working in this right direction. The question is that, do they put enough uh, uh, effort uh, or not? And so maybe Greg, you can say, you know, who do you think that when we talk about disabilities and AI, who do you think that is going to lead the charge here? Who's going to be the most uh, valuable if you if you think there is one, or if it's just going to be completely 
it's hard. distributed or is it like the teenagers or is it the Microsoft and Googles? Well, so it's, it's hard to it's yeah. hard to say. I mean, and I don't I, I don't mean anything to put down the Microsofts or the Googles. They're sure. trying to solve the big pro like the big problem, which means <laughs> the, the a generative AI model for everything, right? Which is awesome. It just means that while they're going along that, there's going to be smaller things that are not necessarily going to get solved along the way. And that's where I think a more distributed, some organic models will pop up, not models, but you know what I mean? Um, solutions, if you will, yeah. um, that solve something in particular. I um, mean, it's not just a particular where it's eyesight versus hearing, but it is a collective, you know, human accessibility um, interface, right? assistant, something like that, right? That can tie together multiple systems at once. So I think what distributed gives you is it helps to crowdsource innovation. It's not that that they're writing better. I mean, the, the, the code bases of the big guys are going to be far better than the code bases of the distributed people. It just allows people to innovate faster and get things delivered sometimes to the end customers, especially while the big guys are trying to solve literally the, you know, the full on generative AI like solution. Um, so I think it'll be a hybrid, right? I mean, even, you know, um, you know, they're partnering, right? The AIs, the Googles, they're partnering with the, the health cares, the telecommunications. So, I mean, they're all working on this together at the same time as well. Um, it's just, you know, you, you know how the list of problems gets prioritized, <laughs> right? Disabilities sometimes don't make it to the top, right? Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. So, yeah. And and I think I think your your point, I know we're not talking about telecom today, but as you say, there will be some more specialist telecom models, algorithms that get developed because telecoms has some unique stuff. We know that you can't just have it, the data can't go out and be generally shared because it's especially when it's customer information, you know, we know it has to be under a more a more controlled environment, perhaps under a more a sovereign environment given given different geographies and so on. So yeah, it's a it's a layering, isn't it? It's a layering of all these AI I think. Yes, and we're going to have something about sensing, which I guess addresses this kind of issues in terms of uh, privacy and what, what are the trade-offs that you're going to have there. But stay tuned, we'll, we'll have one event on this. Um, Greg, there is a question that has come out in a couple of our meetings from Chris, which is, uh, uh, will I be able to see in the metaverse? Now, the question that I would like to ask you is that, uh, will AI enable Chris to see or uh, a deaf person to hear um, in some way. And the reason why I find this question fascinating because it's, it comes gets to the question of what does it mean to see in the first place? I used to be a vision scientist, so I'm a, a little bit biased on, on the, this kind of, of thing. Because, um, but, uh, um, you know, what should we expect? And clearly the AI and vision uh, have been, you know, major so supporting each other. Um, so, and uh, I was uh, last year at Mobile Congress talking to uh, Interdigital, but others are doing the same thing. And they're able, they're, they're working on uh, extracting semantic information from a visual scene. So basically you translate the visual scene into something that is not visual, which I think that that's what Chris was talking earlier about, you know. Yeah. Um, and that's something that has been, you know, traditionally very hard to do. Uh, and that's where you do need, and I think that we might be on a point of actually being able to do this better. Uh, do you want to comment on how, you know, could we expect AI to help us with things like that, to, to, to you know, to basically translate content, analyze, well, kind of, like, say, visual and, content into non-visual stuff? I, I would say for sure. I mean, if you look at, um, like, that example, again, that is a descriptive, um, a description of everything in the visual realm of what is there, right? AI is great at that. And, you know, I'll get back to kind of like the Moore's Law stuff now is like, I mean, the, the big game changer will be when quantum computing comes, but like even with Moore's Law, it, it works, it's pretty fast, right? So we are at the point where an app can pretty much say, uh, you know, you put it on your head and it says, yeah, Greg, turn to the left. I, you're looking at a lamp. You're, I see a green lamp. I see this, I see that. So that for sure is, and the speeds are, are there now. Um, you know, just like with anything, it's going to be, are you going to be able to go down to, you know, your local store and get it for $5.99? Someday, 
you know, when will that happen? When they figure out the business models to make it happen, right? So, you know, it gets back to business, right? Inevitably, the healthcare field of any sort, you know, once you take the business out of it, it tends to be lower in priorities for technology, right? That's, that's the reality that well, I've seen. Great. Greg, what about the cost? You, you mentioned the, the cost and the business case for doing it. I mean, you know, the the money that's been put into it, the compute power that's put into it, but obviously we're, in, we're interested in the network traffic that, that will be generated from it. I mean, is, can you see that, and people are talking about whatever you pay per month for, a, for a, an, an AI service now might well come down to a couple of bucks or something in the future. Can we afford to do all this? I know technically we can do it all, but can we afford to do it? And when you say afford, we like are we as humanity, we as yeah, humanity? all of us, yeah. So, so, <laughs> so I, I guess that you know, in in the in the me being able to see in the future metaverse, or you know, let's say an elderly person at home having all of these services that can recognize what they need to do to re to remind them to take medication. You know, th there is a cost of building all these systems and rendering all this information in a way. I, I just I, I love the idea of it all, but I just. I, I not think that here's the problem <laughs> with computing now the costs i mean it's easy to write the programs and the people need them what you're going to see is a hourglass or bottleneck where people want to control and make money off of that right now the thing that's just like the record industry example right you got all these artists that want to write music all these people that want to listen and it was controlled by about these many people. Yes. Yeah. Yep. You see this throughout the planet. There's lots of examples of this throughout um, our, our economy. And this can be one of those examples. What will help us with that is the crowdsourcing where they can't anymore. Like we can get the stuff out to people. It doesn't cost that much. Sure. It costs, you got to get the connectivity, right? Connectivity to remote areas, to, you know, poverty, you know, impoverished nations, impoverished areas. Yes, that's, you know, literally the physics of, of iron or satellite, right? Once you have anything, you know, decent connection back to the cloud, because all the analytics runs in the cloud, right? All it's doing is streaming back and forth, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't need super heavy compute out at the edge. You need a good a signal, right? 10 megabit, 20, 30, 50, certainly better. And then you can get it isn't that much cost to get it out to people, but what's going to happen is it'll still not get out to them probably because of the hourglass model. Yeah. But, no. uh, but I, go, on, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, but what, what I mentioned before, I think the the compute power in your hand in in a in a smart device, you know, and that's just getting better and better, and then the potential censoring computing in your home or around you in in your village or town wherever you live. I think I think that is why it won't all go back to the center of the cloud, but it doesn't yeah. have to. No, of course. No. But the cloud becomes the cloud becomes the whole collective sure. because it doesn't matter if it can talk back to Seattle or wherever. It's still part of the cloud, <laughs> right? It's only when you're not talking back <laughs> that means you're not in the cloud. Go, on, Monica. Sorry. So, uh, Greg, you I know you you do a lot of volunteering, mentoring. Uh, I say kids just because of an age thing, but they're not, they're not necessarily kids, but um, what is that we could do uh, in terms uh, from sort of our end to sort of encourage or to make them aware uh, of all those inclusivity uh, um, issues? Because, you know, if I were to say, if you're, when you're a teenager, when I was a teenager, you know, the, the, the disability part would be kind of lost on me more so than it is now when I start seeing my own kind of things, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. is there something that we could, should do as individuals or as an industry? Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting because AI and ML is so mainstream now, like a five-year-old probably be like, hey, AI, ML, right? <laughs> so it's, it's not like where you have to have a mind share. In fact, you know, when you talk about volunteering, one of the angles I do is with, what's called NFTE, Network for Technology and Entrepreneurs. And these are kids starting off in either elementary up through high school, uh, following a business plan proposal for various ideas. And they all have these new ideas that include, you know, disabilities, include social 
aspects, you know, but are still have business models behind them. So it's really, you know, quite encouraging to see that, um, that approach. And I think, you know, that youth is already there, you know, the young, young youth is already exposed to AI ML as if it's like, you know, anything else they would call a bread ball, you know, just anything that's around them now. So it's, I think for the younger, it's, it's going to be more about the safeguards and the appreciations and the fact that, you know, it's, it's no more than the safeguards of the internet today, right? You can take a phone and you can put it in a five-year-old and they can literally access the worst of humanity within seconds. Yes. All AI is going to do is make that faster. We still have the problem of, well, how did it, how is it a, a five-year-old was able to access the worst of humanity? That's a different problem. Yeah, you'll just make it easy and make it faster and easier to have that problem, but you got to solve that problem. Well, but you could also resolve it quicker, couldn't you? By an AI, by a, the AI monitoring what the what the child is doing and having that that visibility, that observability that in the network. No, no. That will come, but but yeah. you know, yeah, and you know that will come for 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 parents that didn't know how to do it, right? Because they could have just not. Well, you know, could have done a few more things, but. Yeah, it can definitely help. You know, but it's it's one of those things where it's a race, right? You have you have the hackers and you have, you know, the, the guardians. <coughs> yeah. And you want to be nefarious and then you build in, you know, controls and it's always, you know, it's always going like that. So there's always going to be bleed in of nefarious activities of some sorts. AI will be very beneficial in helping that for sure. But then it'll also be used to <laughs> make it worse too right so can, can i take you back we, we we started and you started talking about ai and, and mental health and the work your, your daughter does for example Did, is that a good example of applying it very specifically and getting very quick returns i well, mean we I'm, haven't gotten returns this is my idea is what i see is an opportunity i haven't done anything i've seen my daughter using different techniques in her toolbox whether it's art, you know, sound, and, you know, obviously we talk a lot and there are apps for, for people with PTSD, with learning disabilities. So the, what went off in my head there more is how do you have some content delivery that is AI infused for people that have cognitive impairment, whether it's PTSD or yeah. whatever. Kind of thing. But, but you know, but but that's but, anything yet. But I don't think that's any different to to my sort of vision of the. Uh, and let's take telecom as the example rather than healthcare. Of, of the telecom industry, when so rather than you keep telling T-Mobile or Vodafone or whoever, you know, don't send me a physical letter, don't send me email. You need to call me or you need to send me sign language. So that translation of content, the adaptation of content, it rendered in a way that suits the individual. Uh, whether and, and in your, what you're describing, it may be PTSD, of course, is very specific. Uh, the example I gave about flashing lights on signatures, you know, once again, so th there has to be a marriage of the identity of the individual, the individual identifying as, you know, requiring this sort of, this is my personalization of how I want information rendered to me. And then the system in the background being able to translate the, the information or the, or the content in a way and delivered in a way that suits the individual. So in, in my head, this is the ultimate personalization of content delivery and information sharing and collaboration because it, it sort of cuts across all these things. Oh, for sure. And that's where potentially a therapist could work with AI views software to deliver their <laughs> therapy. It's not like they're just handing them an app, but yep. they would be working with an AI based system to help deliver the therapy just like they do when they're painting or when they're, you know, listening to music or whatnot. Yep. Yeah. Brilliant. And, and I guess you, you just have AI enabling, sort of building a, a like a book plumbing or kind of like a, a, plat, a set of platform and as you say, it is a tools that then you decide what to do. So something might be very specific and something might be more general that applies to everybody like you know Chris was saying like you know you don't want to do something like uh, animated signatures because there are some people we don't need to, to know exactly who they are but some people it's just like so avoid things that could trigger things so you know pick the right colors because like 10 percent of the population is colorblind so don't just do you know 
to pick colors in a, in a reasonable way. We have a question uh, from Chris, uh, another Chris, uh, is uh, uh, which is, I, I like the idea of crowdsourcing, but how can it become trusted? I mean, the only way I think crowdsourced stuff generally becomes trusted either it makes its way as in the hands of people as a trusted product through just use, where you've used it so many times, like you trust your phone now, whether it's sending the information back to China or not, you trust it at this point, right? <laughs> so, and that didn't become, you know, it came through continuous use and yes, the government telling us and Apple telling us or uh, Samsung or whatnot. Um, generally speaking, great crowdsource ideas elevate into a bigger business model usually, right? And then become, you know, part of the better, you know, democratic system and capitalist system that still is a business, right? I mean, that's the thing is like, you know, there still is going to be a complete business aspect around all of this. And what we want is we want where a business can win, the consumer can win, and then the technology wins and the content and everybody wins, right? And 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 if that 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 what that makes the world go around in a nice way. And so I think we can get to that. Um, it's difficult. I think crowdsourcing just helps force the conversation more, right? Um, sometimes, and it helps pop up ideas, you know, that sometimes the big guys don't come up with right of the shoot. But you know, generally speaking, um, it's tough to have a piece of software that is just crowdsourced into something that is absolutely solid, right? In my mind, yeah, and, and I guess if you go back to sort of AI and generally the you know have being able to share information on the internet where it's so much so easy to create content, everybody can do it, and not everybody should be trusted, obviously. Uh, so I guess that we need from the other end of the receiving end of access any content, whether it's crowdsourcing AI or whatever, we need to develop a sort of a, a awareness on how to assess it. In the same way that something just because it's printed doesn't mean that it's true doesn't mean that because it's in the internet it's true and people just need we, we i guess we it's an educational effort which is not trivial what i no, think it's, it's but tough. I, th I think it's also let's think about the platforms across which these apps will be consumed and delivered and you know the the, the toolkits that uh, that apple have that the the android community have in in the mobile world you know there are certain checks and balances in there you know with who knows what under web web 3.0 checks and balances will, will be out there as well so I, I of course it's up to the industry to make sure that when things get brought in and used that they are valid i mean i i still would love to know how that how are we going to tell whether something's been ai produced in a from whatever system it should there be a water stamp on the you know on ai ai generated material uh, i know that the edu education system is obviously very focused on this at the moment um, as useful as useful as all these tools are, you know, we 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 do need to know who's generated it and where it's come from, and the authenticity of it. And I think that's part of this. This project is a good question. It, it, we do need to make sure the policing, if I if I dare use that word of this, to go back to the regulation, that the policing of the so so we're not abusing it. So it is it is inclusive to go to to go back to the whole purpose of what we're talking about, and that it that it does it does bring everybody into the fold. So yes, there's a massive opportunity, but we do need to be very, very aware of the uh, of the bad actors, as I think the black cats, as I think you mentioned. Absolutely, Monica, yeah. I think you no, need think, to wrap no, no. us up. Yeah. We need to wrap it up. Uh, so, uh, well, thank you again so much for uh, uh, Greg for for being with us and uh, all of you in the audience. And uh, the conversation is going to be available soon. And also you can go to the uh, link here uh, to uh, that I shared with you before uh, to uh, register for new events and also for uh, watch previous ones. Um, also, I would like to point out that uh, Chris and I will be will have a panel at the MEF Connects in London on November 28th, and then we will be in uh, um, Amsterdam uh, on November 22 and 22, 23 uh, at the Total Telecom Congress uh, uh, to talk about this uh, uh, as well. So we hope to see you there and uh, thank you all for participating.
Greg, thank you thank so you. much. Great thank job. You, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Take care. Have a bye great bye. day.